Uh, Fiona, thank you. And I want to just begin by saying that I've seen quite a large number of exhibitions of Doris's work over the years, but this is really one of the most beautiful. And you used the word a moment ago, profound. I think it's also a very profound exhibition because it covers so much of the work and it hints at so many other projects which Doris has also enjoyed. Um, we're sitting in, by common consent, is one of the most beautiful museums in the world. And, we're, and it is also one of the most serene museums in the world. It's a place where you can really look at art and enjoy art. But it's also a place which now houses this exhibition by Doris. And there's a paradox, really, because if you go upstairs, and many of you will have been in the exhibition, you have this sense of absolute serenity. But then you begin to look harder, and you then begin to understand that the work, as Doris herself says, my work springs out of misery. And Doris's work shows, in a very serene way, the inequities of the world and what she called the roughness of the world, I think. Those places where people who don't have suffer and people who have maybe look away. And as I think we all know, something like one in seven people in this world is in some sense displaced or in movement at the moment. That's an incredible figure. If you think about taking one seventh of the people who are in this room and you say, you no longer have a home, you don't belong, you're on the margin, you're outside, you know, that section of the audience is gone. I hope you'll stay, but <laughs> for the mo for metaphorically, you're, you're gone. So it's a strange paradox, as I say, that we sit here in this most beautiful museum, we look at objects that are themselves extremely beautifully made, and yet they deal with the most appalling crimes and the most appalling violence, both physical violence, but also a violence about denying people their rights, a different kind of institutional violence. So we're going to talk a little bit, I think, first about some of the works in the exhibition. And we don't have any images of those because you can go upstairs and see those. Um, and then we'll move on and talk with some slides about some of the more public commissions and one or two of the pieces such as, well, for, for, to take one example, Shibboleth, or the piece that was shown in Istanbul in um, 20, uh, 2003. These works, which no longer exist, we will represent somehow with, 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 with images. So, Doris, um, you were born in the late 50s in Bogota, and in 1964, the FARC was established as a left-wing guerrilla group in Colombia. And in a way, that, that wasn't exactly the beginning, because there had obviously been troubles before. But it marked a moment at which, in a certain sense, violence became institutionalized, and violence became a pattern of life in Colombia. And I just wanted to ask, to begin with, really, what it felt like. I mean, we can move away from biography quite quickly. But I would be interested to know a little bit more about what it felt like to grow up in Colombia in the 60s and early 70s as a young person. Was, was the violence already a sense of pervasive everywhere, or was it still rather isolated? Well, I think it's a very good question, uh, because I, I always move, move, want to move away from biography. But it, biography is important, because the work as I, as I have always say, is a collective, is the product of, of, of a collective effort. And of course, the place where I was born is, is really meaningful to, to my work. 
um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission marked the beginning of, of, the, of the civil war in Colombia in 1958, uh, not, not, not exactly in, in 64. Uh, when the FARC was, was created, but a little before. And I was born in 1958. So, uh, so it means that throughout my life, I have experienced war. Uh, I wouldn't say that exactly firsthand, but violence was part of our daily life. Uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't experience it personally, nor any member uh, of my family, but it was uh, a daily event. Um, and, and it, it, it did not allow you to have uh, a distance and to have perspective, uh, a comfortable perspective, and to look at events far away. Things were happening and were constantly happening, and, 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 and you were involved in, in, this, uh, in this violence. So it was quite dramatic uh, to have this amount of violence happening uh, all the time, permanently. At that time, this kind of violence was happening only in the, in the Global South. Uh, the Global North at that time didn't have terrorism, and the daily massacres that take place in the US weren't as common then. So, so it felt like, like violence really was an event that was happening in Colombia. I later changed that perspective, of course, to, to, to a broader view of the world, but, but at that time it was it defined my work and defined myself. And in, and in growing up in that way, and as you say, defining yourself, you decided at a certain point that you were going to focus your interest and expression in art. Did that feel like a, a form of expression that would be able to address some of the questions that you were facing? I don't think I took uh, conscious decisions. Oh, yes. yeah. I think there were things that were there with me, like, I, I don't recall the one day I said, I'm going to be an artist. It was something that was always with me. Also, I don't recall thinking that I was going to be a sculptor. It was always with me. I don't recall the moment when that happened, and nor when I decided to, to address political violence. It was always there for me. So it, 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 it's something that, that exceeds uh, conscious decision. It, it exceeds mm -hmm. uh, um, the knowledge I had at the time. And I was... Uh, I guess the first conscious decision I made as an artist was to, to return, when I went to New York to study, then I returned to Colombia. That was, uh, that, was, that was a conscious decision. I'm going to tell a story that has not been told from a, from a perspective that had not been uh, occupied before. Um, so uh, that's why I, I, uh, I, when I went back, I immersed myself in the reality, what, what was happening, what really what happened, really researching, really looking at every detail and at every story, uh, obs obsessively researching. So I placed myself, myself in that reality. And as you say, it was a very conscious decision. You were in New York in the early 80s studying, but you went back to Bogota. You could have stayed in New York. I mean, many artists who go to study in New York don't return. So why did you go back? I thought it was useless to tell a story that, like, New York story had been told so many times. And, and I felt that there was this deep need to tell the story from the perspective of the defeated ones. That had not been done at that time. So we, um, I, I always say that when, when, when I was growing up, uh, the term Global South, that is quite decent, uh, was not used at that mm -hmm. time. At that time, we were called underdeveloped. Underdeveloped which, countries. Underdeveloped country, which meant that, that we had an underdeveloped intelligence, underdeveloped art, not only underdeveloped societies and, and, and industry and economy, mm -hmm. but underdeveloped way of thinking. And I think that, that that's such an insult, that's so terrible for, for generations of people of, of, of people in the Global South, of all these brown and black communities, to, to be born with that weight, to, to grow up with that weight. So I wanted to think, I wanted to, to tell that story and to give dignity, give, to achieve the dignity that had been robbed uh, by uh, colonialism uh, and, ra and racism. I wanted that back, I wanted that dignity back. And, and did you see artists or writers who 
acted as models for you in any way? Yes, yes. There were two. Um, uh, of course, G Garcia Marquez as a writer was mm -hmm. important, but there were two important painters in Colombia who were doing it. Um, uh, one of them was Beatriz Gonzalez, my professor, and another um, uh, uh, artist that came before, they were Arango, was a really powerful artist as mm -hmm. well. So yes, there was, the, the way was open. So you came back and then you, as you say, you immersed yourself. And I suppose probably the one of the first products of that is the first room in this exhibition, where you memorialize a particular massacre in a plantation. Do you want to explain how that came about and what, why you chose that subject? Um, I was, uh, at the time I decided that I could not understand, and of course up to today I do not understand evil, but I do my best to understand it, because I think that terrible events that are considered unspeakable mm -hmm. need to be studied, and, 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 and they have, we need to, und I needed to understand what's happening. If you don't understand evil, evil will continue happening. Mm -hmm. There are always uh, practical, uh, pragmatic um, reasons as mm -hmm. to why these events uh, take place, why violence take place, is rather, um, a rational decision mm. uh, and in many occasions planned. Uh, so I, I want to, to see this, um, this, the area where this terrible massacre had happened. Uh, it was a massacre of the banana workers and, and banana companies, including Chiquita Bananas, uh, had paid the paramilitary death squads to kill uh, the workers who were attempting to unionize. Mm. And so for the first time, I, I, I thought of acts of mourning, what it meant for the widow uh, who had, and the, not only the widow, the family, who had witnessed the murder of the, of, of the <coughs> father uh, right in front of, the, of their little homes. Uh, what it meant for, for, for her to endure life without that person and with this traumatic event. So I thought that this folding of the shirts and, 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 and putting it through this metal uh, bar, uh, this, this, this uh, was like a funeral oration. Mm. It was the first time I was thinking of mourning, not only of the violence that had taken place. I, I, I move away from the perpetrator and focus on the, on the victim, yeah. uh, on the survivor, on the one who had a story to tell and an act of mourning uh, to, to, to develop day after day after day of her new life, her new uh, bereft life. So that was the first time I did that. And, and from then on, I've been trying to uh, put together a poetics of mourning. Mm. And, but that was the first, the first time I did it. I mean, you, you use the phrase just now, the poetics of mourning. I mean, what I think so compelling about so much of your work is that it is poetry rather than, as it were, a novel or narrative. I mean, it's, it's not... You don't describe what happened. You talk about what is no longer there, what is absent, the gaps in a way that we cannot perceive. It's like not the chair, but the space under the chair or the space around the chair. So you have a presence that is no longer there in terms of the victim, in the, in the, the literal victim, who was murdered, but then also, of course, um, there is the other victim who is the person who, who remains. Not the next room, but further into the exhibition, obviously you moved into conveying that sense of absence when you adopted the use of concrete and furniture. And there is a very powerful room here in the exhibition. Do you want to explain what the genesis was of that particular group of works, and it's probably the group for which you were first best known and most widely seen in Europe and America. Well, that I began that uh, group of works when um, a genocide of a political party 
took place in Colombia and, and uh, more than 5,700 5, members of this party were, were exterminated uh, mostly by the oh, Colombian can you, army. Can you say that again? How many? Uh, I believe it's 5,733, but um, I, I and they were systematically... And they were systematically killed. It was called the UP mm. um, uh, party. And they... So I start interviewing widows in that case. And they were, as opposed to the previous um, victims I had interviewed that were in the rural areas, these were uh, city dwellers and were people with more means, uh, economic means. So uh, I always try to um, take a word or an image or an object that is given to me uh, by these persons and out of that uh, make, uh, make this, uh, this, this, this group of, of works. I, at some point I attempted to make thousands and I, I, I gave up after 20 years of making them uh, because I wanted to show that the, the absurdity of, of of, of this genocide that was taking place in Colombia. So, the, so I, I am seeing, you, you, you said that, that uh, you mentioned what is no longer there, but I would like to add what it has not still been formed. It's, a, it's like a liminal stage, it's an in-between. I, I wanted to show the, the, the moment of, of, the, of, the, uh, of life, uh, of when, when, when uh, wooden furniture is being used, and then the moment where it no longer can be used, where it becomes dysfunctional, because the person who uses it is no longer there. So I, see, I, I, I was trying to connect the past and the present, but of course we know there is no common measure between past and present. Mm -hmm. So that's, why, that's, that's where the awkwardness of these pieces come from, is this tension. Uh, because um, even though concrete is such a radical material that, that, that implies silence, uh, it implies death, is the last word. When you put concrete or something, that's it, that's the last word. But at the same time, the concrete is placed meticulously and with care. So there is this tension, there is this contradiction. I wanted it to be paradoxical. You don't know whether you're destroying or you're fixing or whether you're trying to keep something or you're trying to forget. And probably it is, it is the tension of both what I think gives um, these pieces is, uh, uh, their character. Yeah, and also the concrete is a material which is obviously used in construction, housing. It's also, there are so many stories of people being killed and then buried in the foundations of concrete foundations and so on. So there are all kinds of associations that grow from the use of that material. Yeah, yes, yes, of course. It's a, it's a brutal material. Mm. And, and, it's the, and that's why I thought it was the appropriate material uh, to address a brutal act, mm. like murder. So, um, but at the same time, uh, I did not <coughs> want the concrete to, to say the last word. Mm. So there are bits of fabric that are, uh, then the wood uh, uh, managed to be on top of the, uh, like the back of chairs or, mm. or little tables. Uh, they managed to be on top of the concrete. So, so concrete is not allowed to have the last word. Um, there's always, uh, the meticulous reconstruction and the destruction. It, it, it is both continuously. So as I make the piece, I was both the victim and the perpetrator, the one who was in mourning and the one who was destroying. So I had to play both roles when making these pieces. So in both of the works we've just been talking about, in a way that you are an observer, you're recording something, you're translating it. But then when you come to um, the next work that I'd like to talk about is Atra uh, Biliaros, with the shoes hidden behind, partially hidden behind the skin. And this is a work that I think grew for the first time for you out of talking to victims in a different way and recording testimony. Can you say something about the way in which you prepared for that work and... I. I was fortunate to work with a human rights lawyer who unfortunately was the later murderer. And he, he walked me 
um, he allowed me to be with him while he was researching uh, a case of a guerrilla woman that had been disappeared uh, after leaving uh, her son's first communion party. Mm. And she was seen uh, in, a autobus, uh, in a bus stop and then she, she disappeared. At that time, there were no DNN um, mm. tests available in Colombia, at least. And so uh, the, the, the men at the graveyard recognized the shoes that the, that the woman was, mm. was wearing, and that's how she was recognized. And then I found out that many people were recognized by the shoes. Mm. So that's why I decided to, um, uh, uh, to borrow shoes from families uh, who had, um, whose members had been disappeared, <laughs> and they, they lend the shoes to me. Uh, uh, because they keep everything that, that the person owned. They are always suspected, they are always awaiting the return of that person. So they, they for the first time I made that piece, I made it with the shoes that were, were, that were given to me by the families. Evidently, those were historical objects and I could not intervene them. Yeah. So that's why I decided <laughs> to keep them in this, uh, under this, this animal fiber um, without, uh, touching them or damaging them. Then I destroyed that piece and gave the shoes back to the families. And the ones that are now are shoes that I, that I just bought. Yeah. Um, uh, no, no longer, uh, I don't feel I have the right to, mm. to deal with those, those objects. Uh, so it's the, it's the, it's the fact that, that these families were mourning in silence within the realm of each private uh, family. They were crying uh, and they were going through unbelievable pain. And I thought it was important since it was happening to so many people. We have about 150,000 missing people in Colombia. Um, so I wanted to create a public space in which all this uh, private pain could become a public, a public issue, uh, mm -hmm. a, pro a public uh, problem. So as you said, the skin is stitched across to, to make a, effectively a kind of hidden showcase. And stitching becomes a very important part of your work and sewing becomes an important part of your work. And that's very uh, evident in a work like Unland, the three tables in that single room. But it's, that for me is also a very interesting work because it's a moment when you start to place your experience in Colombia in a wider context of the world, really, because there are references there to something very specific in, that you experienced in Colombia, but also you relate it to the poems of Paul Ceylon, the Romanian poet who wrote so beautifully and movingly about the Holocaust. So was that a moment for you when you began to think about as I perceive it at least, you know, not just Colombia, but also the wider world. Well, the Holocaust has been present for me from the very beginning. Mm. I, since I was a teenager, I remember being reading about the Holocaust mm. and, uh, and the Holocaust had been um, expressed in brilliant, brilliant uh, manners um, that were, uh, there was no equivalent in Colombia. Mm. Colombian violence had not been expressed uh, the way, I don't know, all the, all the Jean Améry or all the wonderful Primo Levi or, or, or Celan or all these, um, or Nelly Sachs or all these, all these wonderful thinkers and poets. Uh, so it was my essential source of reading. I, I always work based on the testimony of a victim and then I try to find uh, um, material traces uh, mm. of, 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 that, of that tragedy in objects. And there is always, I'm always reading. I'm always reading poets or philosophers. And so I'm just, I'm, I, I'm just crossed by all these, these, these three different elements that I'm mm. always trying to assemble in my work. So, so Celan was there uh, to give, to, to guide me. Um, to illuminate the way, um, and and in his um, uh, unbelievable ability not to not to name directly, uh, but that always just uh, the he utters uh, he enunciates 
the very minimum, without uh, a comma, without a letter, the, the sense will fall apart. And it is in that precarity of sense mm. uh, that, I, that I thought that I could uh, um, express this, this trauma address, this terrible experiences of children who had witnessed the murder of their parents. Yeah. Um, and so it was this, um, this um, uh, Jewish prohibition uh, to represent directly uh, that I formed myself. I think it was a very important influence in my work. It, was, it, was, it determined the way I, I work. It's never presenting violence, always stepping before, before, mm. before the violent act or, 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 or many years after when it's been forgotten. Mm. It's, 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 it's either before or, or after. So that's why Celan was so important for me. And I was obsessively reading Celan and memorizing Celan's poems uh, in, this, in this work, uh, to the point where the title of the work, Anland, is a, is a word that I made up, but I, at the time I didn't, I didn't realize it. I thought it was Celan's word. Mm. And, and for a long time I look and look and I couldn't find it. Of course I couldn't find it because I made it up, but I was so <laughs> immersed in, in his writing that I thought it was his. I owe him everything. So this work, as you say, is a response to young children who have witnessed the death of their parents. And you refer to the orphan's tunic, that connects obviously with Celan. But there are also these very fine hairs which tie together the elements of the tables. Where, where, what was the origin of the use of hair in that way? Because it becomes, again, a kind of leitmotif through your work. Yeah, it is. I, th there are really uh, dramatic, terrible stories. I, I, I met a, a family, there were like seven children um, uh, wh whose father had been killed in a massacre and the mother was uh, agonizing when I, when I met them, mm. um, had been wounded in the same massacre and they had nothing. They had absolutely nothing, hmm. nothing. Uh, and they were on the streets, they had n n literally nothing. So I thought, I, I always tried to make a piece out of, of, of the, mater ma the material possibilities of, of the victims. And in this case, they had nothing but their own body. So hmm. I thought, okay, you have to be here. There's nothing else, they have nothing else. So I restrict myself to, to what they had access to. And, and uh, as, as, as um, Levina said, there are people who have nothing but the vulnerability of their, their own skin. Or as the poet um, Oshan Vong says, uh, she had nothing but her time on this earth. And these people have nothing, mm. nothing. So that's why I had to restrict myself to human hair, because that's all they had, mm. their own body. That sense of um, individuals being, sh in a way, shorn of their identity, but nevertheless holding on to something is, is I think, comes across also in um, Plegaria Muda, where you have this assembly of tables with the grass growing through, which is like to be, in a way, in a place with a mass grave and to be in a situation where the only memory is a stick or maybe a cross or something, but not always even a name. No name. No name. Um, is my reading of that work, does that encompass some of the things that you were concerned, you know, you w wish to convey in that, in, the, in, in that work? Absolutely, absolutely. I, um... As I'm, as I'm following closely the events that developed in Colombia, mm. I'm also keeping an eye on whatever is happening all over the world. And I, I like to equate civil war with gang violence. Mm. Uh, and gang violence is going on all over the world, unfortunately. And both gang violence and civil war are fratricidal wars. Mm. So 
whoever it's, it's usually happening among poor people. Mm. Um, and so that's why the chairs could be reversible and it will be pretty much the same. same. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to show that all over the world there are mass graves. Uh, Europe, of course, after the wars, might have many mass graves. There are mass graves being constructed right now in, in, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are mass graves all over the world. And that's, 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 uh, that's the duty of art, is to name, is to address, is to signal uh, where the society does not want to see. Mm -hmm. We all know that they exist, but we don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are plenty in Spain, for example, uh, and, 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 and it, is, it is a contested issue whether, whether they, they, people are going to, or, or, or governments are actively going to look for them. Uh, of course, there are mass graves in, in now. Uh, the Mediterranean is a mass grave. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many in, in, in Greece. or uh, it's, it's, it's just a, a fact of our life. So I felt that, that I had to signal mass grave. And I, I'm not aware, I'm sure there are pieces about mass grave, but I'm not aware of it. Mm -hmm. And so I felt I had to do that. I have to signal mass grave. But it's not a, a grave on which you walk on top, comfortably mm -hmm. on top of it. So you are clearly uh, distanced from, from death. It is more that you are walking within that, and it becomes like a labyrinth mm. in which you are disoriented, in which you are kind of lost. And, and, uh, but, but at the same time, I wanted to present that, it, that, that each single piece is, 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 is like, a, like a grave, an individual grave. Mm. It's no longer a mass grave. So uh, uh, a precarious burial took place, but each one is being singled out because poor people uh, don't have time, don't have uh, space in life. They, they, we see that migrants are being pushed out of their land and they, they are forced to die in an on-site, whether a desert or, a, or whatever, and, and, and gang members or, 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 or uh, victims of the civil war in Colombia are all thrown into, into mass graves. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted, they are, they are not marked, but they are singular. And I, think that as long as, as we are alive, as long as art is being made, life prevails. Mm. So mm, it's, we cannot uh, deliver the death entirely to death. We ha because the, we are here, we are alive, and we're telling their story. So that's why the grass is there, to show that life prevails. You have that same sense, of course, in Palimpsest, which is a work which I think now belongs to the Byler. Is that no? No. It's, no, sh it's no. been shown here it's before. It's been shown here it's for been a, shown for a long here time. Before. Yeah. And that sense of a, an individual, a person, an identity disappearing, but then re emerging, both in the memory and you know, beyond. I mean, Palimpsest is a work which. I suppose grows out of your increasing concern about my, the, the impact of migration and people being pushed from one part of the world to another. And it, was, it for, was its form very much generated by what was happening in the Mediterranean or more generally? I think migration is the main, one of the, and climate crisis, of course, the main mm. issues of our time. And I thought that, well, you have so many migrants from Africa, from the Middle East, from mm. the Global South, dying <coughs> when crossing borders, that I, I thought, I'm amazed that, that they are not crying. There's no grief, uh, there's no mourning. Um, it's like, we know it is happening, maybe it is happening right now as we mm. sit here, and nobody cares. And I am in Colombia, a country with tons of problems. Uh, I thought it was important to mourn those people from, from a country that it's, 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 it's in, itself in, in crisis. And, and so to unite the world, like, and to, and to assert the fact that we, we, we need to create a 
common humanity. We need to understand <coughs> that humanity is one. It's not that they are, well, they are sub-Saharan Africans, they can die, or, or you know, Central Americans, they can die, and, and nobody cares, uh, just to prevent the so-called invasion. Um, and so I wanted, uh, I wanted this dignity. I want to dignify these lives. I wanted um, to present these names with the clarity and brightness and stubbornness of a mother grieves. If a mother sees the name of, 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 of her daughter or son, uh, that name will carry uh, a specific uh, meaning. It, it, it symbolizes the whole, her whole world. And I wanted these, these names to bright, to be, shine, to be shiny, and, and to uh, become present in a, in a specific space. They, they were not allowed, they were forced to die uh, in an on-site. They did not choose to die there. They were mm. forced to by xenophobic policies, by racist policies that were rationally thought. And so I want these presences to be there for a, for a second uh, and, then, and then it's gone. And then, and then it's gone. So it's like, it's like a constant act of mourning. The presence almost forms, but never is quite formed, and then it goes away. Mm. So I needed that, and I needed to name those names, because those names are, are being forgotten. So you have a first layers of names that are written uh, with, with sand, mm. that are hardly readable. Those belong to victims that died uh, before the year 2000. And then the newer names are being, are being formed with water. Um, there are... Uh, of victims that uh, die between the 2000 and 2016, mm -hmm. uh, when I stopped the research, and and so it forms a palimpsest, and it shows how the latest catastrophe so erases the prior one, and, and we keep forgetting and forgetting and forgetting. So in a way, this 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 work uh, works just just like our memory that is so fragile, and we keep forgetting. Yeah. Our capacity for being astonished when there is a disaster of some kind and a large loss of life, for instance, on the Mediterranean, and then, as you say, it disappears and it comes again months later. Yeah, yeah. And, no, and, and, and unfortunately, nobody cares. Nobody cares because those human beings are not quite humans. Uh, they are alive. I mean, I think when we see images of these boats full mm. of people, we recognize that they, are, that they might need water or food, mm. but we don't recognize who they are, mm. uh, what their desires or what their aspirations might be, whether they were loved or, or they left uh, 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 children behind. I mean, we don't, we don't not a, a complete life is not recognized on them. Mm. It's just the fact that they, they are they are like uh, almost like uh, like a wild animal, you know, that we recognize that they w they are alive, but we don't take care of them, so they are just there, forgotten. I mean, you talked about the fact that in Palimpsest, you did a great deal of research, and you were looking at the names of victims from before two thousand and then after two thousand. So, was that a work that you had been thinking about making for a long time, or? Was there some particular trigger for you or an opportunity for you to make that a work on that scale? Certainly there was not an opportunity. I had to be really stubborn and work alone for five years. <laughs> uh, because it was very hard to find a place uh, to house this piece. Mm. It was extremely difficult. So I worked yeah. for five years intensely, both in the piece itself, which is uh, quite complex technically, but also uh, researching the names. Mm. One of the, of the things that, 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 that was very painful for me was that as I was researching, I was writing to Frontex and to many agencies of, of the European Union to get uh, the list of names, and it was denied to me. And then I started writing to NGOs in Italy and in Greece, and it was denied to me. I wrote to the Red Cross, I wrote to everyone. Uh, finally, I had to visit, we have to visit some, uh, um, my assistant visits um, uh, uh, 
uh, cemeteries uh, in Greece and Italy, and, uh, and we follow, uh, at the time there was Syrian press and Turkish mm. press and Egyptian press, mm. and of course, Western press as well. And we follow social media because the family post uh, uh, images and, 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 and short biographies of, of the people. So it was five years of researching names. Uh, quite difficult because nobody understood why somebody down there in Colombia wanted mm. that information. Mm. So it was, it's quite, it's terrible that, no, that sure the information was, was denied. Yeah. I mean, some of it had probably been published, but then just pushed to one side and... Very few were published, very yeah. few were published, mm. um, very few. And, and, and they, and, and the majority have no names also. I want to turn to a slide now because um, you talked about the fact that um, Palimpsest is a work that you researched over a long period of time. Now this is a work which you made in 2002 about an event that had occurred shortly after you returned to Colombia in 1985. Yeah. So there was this event in 85, and what caused you in 2002 to decide that you wanted to recover it and restore it and bring it back into the memory? Well, I, I was, I, as you say, I had just returned to Colombia, mm. and I was working two blocks away from, from, from the original yeah. building. And from the original Palace of Justice. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I heard the gunshots and I ran, uh, to the main square of Bogota, and I saw the, the armored tanks already attacking the building. Mm. Um, so I, I, I was a witness of this total war that, that broke in the, in the heart of Bogota, yeah. in front of, the, of, of Congress, in front of the presidential house and, 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 and city hall. Um, and from the very beginning, I thought that I wanted to make a peace uh, but uh, for many years, and I, th uh, the the building was was not I was not allowed in. Finally, like five years after that, uh, I was the building was demolished. But the, the so the building the basement, was damaged during the during... had been burned completely burned down, and so five years later it was demolished. But the basement uh, was there full of objects that had traces of the attack. So you have furniture that had, that, that had bullet holes or, or, uh, or, or libraries um, uh, that, that were completely burned and, and, and almost fossilized. And so I start uh, writing letters and requesting this object. And every time I requested an object, the object disappeared. And I kept doing it, and I kept doing it, and I kept doing it. And uh, finally, there were very few objects by 1995, and I thought of making a huge uh, exhibit with these with this objects at the uh, National Museum of Bogota, and I was censored. Mm. Uh, I was not allowed to do it. And so I kept trying and trying and trying until the very last object I requested, which were some, some window frames, uh, they, would, they also disappeared. They were sent to different jails to make crafts out of them in order to completely obliterate the memory of the event. So I, I made many, many attempts until I realized, okay, there's nothing left. So I, I have to do something. I was, uh, and then I start writing letters asking for permissions to do an event, and I was not allowed to do it. Um, I was I, sorry, I did not receive any answer. So uh, the person who, who administrated the building, an architect, um, made a deal with me. He said, you are allowed to come into the building in secret at night and do whatever you need to build on the roof of the building, and but if if permission is not given to you by the Supreme Court, you you lose you, you're going to lose your, your 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 work. And so the the day before, that is November fifth at five p.m. I remember I received a fax at that time. There were fax mm -hmm. of the Supreme Court saying that I was allowed to do this performance. I guess they thought that I would have no time 
to prepare to, do so, to prepare for next day and but i had had everything they did, ready they didn't know that you were on the roof yes <laughs> they had no clue <laughs> they had no clue so fortunately i was uh, i was allowed to do it next day at 11:35 uh when the first person was murdered uh i was allowed to start lowering these these chairs on the facade of the new building so each chair represents one of the people who Yes. Was killed in yes. the uh, or, or 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 were missing. Yeah. I had I had the autopsies of 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 all the victims and I tried to pretty much play according to to the time of approximate time of, of, of the death of each person. So how long did the performance last for? It lasted fifty three hours. It lasted the same time that the as, that, as that, a siege. At the siege. Just showing. And this brings us to another public piece in Istanbul, where you, this was a vacant lot. Apparently, a building had been torn down, but obviously, it had been, em this lot had been empty for many, many years, and you filled it entirely with chairs. Um, even in an image of this kind, you can see, feel the impact. I heard it from people in the audience, just astonished. Tell us about the origin of this piece, because you were invited to go to Istanbul to be in the Biennale. Yeah. This yeah. wasn't a commission, but you had an opportunity. I was invited to, to go to Istanbul to see if I could make a, a piece what? there. So I went there to research. I had so, no so clue. Just, I want to ask, do you often get invitations where you're invited like that and you go and you do research, but you then do not develop a piece? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I always, always develop a piece. I always do. I always do. I have a duty. I have to do it. Um, so I, w I went there, and as I was uh, walking around Istanbul, I noticed that there were in, in rich areas, in a mm. rich city, it makes no sense to see so many ruins yeah. or, or vacant lots. Yeah. I couldn't, and I, then I started researching why, why there are so many, because there are many. Mm. And, and then I realized that, that they had belonged to the both Jewish and Armenian community that had been expelled and had mm. been, uh, well, it was a genocide in uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, there was a tax that was more than 230 two percent tax that of course nobody could pay and people were displaced into labor camps or, mm. or, or, or were, they were killed. So I wanted to make a piece about war, about displacement and about the fact that, that even though war is so close to us, uh, the, the point where, where our normal everyday life begins, then war and then we continue. <coughs> with normal, li no, yeah. normal everyday life, like, like nothing. So I wanted to inscribe this, this uh, I call it a topography of war. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to inscribe it in, in between these buildings that are functional the, and, 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 and the memory of why this, this building is, is no longer in place. It's, yes, people know and, and you yeah. just, we all know about what is happening. We all know about these events, and we tend to forget about it. Mm. Uh, it's more comfortable. It's easier to lead life that way. So I, I, I decided to make this, this really uh, airless um, piece uh, that doesn't have. Uh, uh, the perspective one needs to look at a piece, at an object, comfortable. Uh, so it is, uh, and it is, it is, it is. We know what is going on. Once you have seen one chair or two, you know uh, the scrutiny is useless because the experience this is addressing is well, it, it's well known. We all know it, mm -hmm. and that's why I, I think the repetition and the chaos of war it's important. There is a complete flatness on the surface of this piece. Yes. It's completely flat, and yet it is chaotic. So I wanted to again show that war is rational. It is planned. 
Uh, you see the flatness. Yeah, you see the flatness. <laughs> uh, war is, is, you know, there is a, an elegant uh, arm designer, probably a very rich arm designer sitting in an office somewhere mm. in the Global North, uh, designing how an arm will destroy the tissue of a human being. Uh, all this is planned, carefully planned. Mm. And even though what we see uh, at, the, at the receiving end of war is chaos, pure chaos and destruction, there is a rationality uh, behind it that is just so brutally cruel. Uh, that is beyond the cruelty of the soldier. I mm. think it's the, the cruelty of the planners, of the designers of the planning. So that's why I wanted to address in this piece. Thank you. Actually, I'm going to jump now because okay. we're beginning to move against time and I probably can't jump over, no, I don't want to jump over this because this is the beginning in a way of a series of works which you did in the Plaza de Bolivar and which involved not you but obviously involved you but also large numbers of other people and this becomes a different kind of social sculpture. How do you decide when you, it's the right moment to try and work in this very public way? I don't decide. Okay. It is being decided. I was working on Shiboleth behind a schedule hmm. up to here uh, of work. And then the guerrilla killed uh, five members of the council of, of, this, of, of this city. Uh, Cali, and uh, they had been kidnapped for five years, and then they they were mm. they were murdered, and I felt like I had to do something. I had to go out and do something. So I um, there are so many massacres and so many tragedies that takes place in Colombia that, that we don't have time to to commemorate each one, mm. and so we are anesthetized. Uh, so. I wanted, I, I lit 24,000 candles um, and I, I had to prepare them so the wind will not blow them away. Mm. So I prepared them in two days uh, with lots of, uh, I, I make an open so call mm. and people help. And, and then I, I place them in order to show that it was not an spontaneous act. That, and, and to remind us that we have to mourn and so people came out and helped because I only had a few hours to do it. Mm. Uh, so it's not my choice. I, when I do things uh, in, on, on the street, it's because something terrible happened and I need to go out you immediately. Need to, you need to mark that, okay, that immediately. moment. Immediately, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And what was the response of the authorities to this? Well, the... It, <coughs> They don't respond. They don't respond. Uh, and I'm used to it. <laughs> and in a way, it's good. Mm. Uh, we could talk about this f for a long time, this piece, <laughs> because I was r rather closely involved in it. I, I really want to just ask you, I think at a certain point, you said about this piece that you wanted to bring the issues of the Global South to the Global North. I think you were very conscious that the Tate, this is Tate Modern, of course, and it's the Turbine Hall, and it was, a commit, it was an invitation from Tate to Doris to make a work in that space without any preconditions of any kind. And as for so many other works, that she makes, she tested everyone, including me. <laughs> um, but I'm, you talk about the Global South and Global North. You were conscious, I think, that the Tate bears the name of Henry Tate. Henry Tate made his money by being a grocer, but especially by being a seller of sugar. And although he started his business after slavery had been abolished, as they say, at least in England, we talk about it being abolished as if it somehow stopped. We know very well that it didn't. Yeah. But the 
trade that he was engaged in was very much based on the slave economy. And I think he wanted to bring, as you say, some of the concerns of the Global South right into the heart of a colonial city. Do you want to say something about that aspect of the yeah. work? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say that this piece uh, existed because of you. You made it possible. Mm. And I want, I want to acknowledge that. And, mm. and I'm always thankful to you because you allowed me. Um, this is a very um, extreme proposition to present to a museum. Mm. And you were brave enough to, to let it happen. Mm. Um, I was invited and I was aware of the fact that I was the first a uh, non, non-European, non-white mm. person to be invited there. So I wanted to bring uh, what I was, uh, the place where I came from and, and the place we occupy in the world, which is under, unfortunately. Mm. All the brown and, and black people in this world, we are under. Uh, there is this horrible word in English, underclass. In English, underclass. underclass yeah. And, and, and I, I, I hate that word and the word, the way it is, it is used. So I wanted to occupy that negative space that has been allocated to us uh, in, in the Global North. Uh, so it was absolutely essential uh, for me to address what you just said about uh, um, heritage. Uh, I wanted also to talk about the fact that, that the Turbine Hall is a modernist building and modernity is considered to be uh, an entirely white uh, development. So uh, it's like modernity happened without colonialism. And of mm. course we know it is impossible. It is colonialism and, and slavery uh, what made modernity possible. Mm. So uh, racism and colonialism is the, is the untold part of, of modernity. So I wanted that to be evident that in this modernist building, uh, we were at the, at the base of it, is what made it possible. I also, uh, uh, when, when, when I was invited, I sat in the turbine hall for a week or so, and I was looking, uh, carefully uh, at the attitude of people. When they walk in, they will all look up and go like, wow. They, were, they marvel at the building. I, and I couldn't really understand why. I mean, mm. we know we can build tall buildings. We know we can build this kind of industry. I, I couldn't understand this, this astonishment and this amazement of, of people. So I wanted to, to change that perspective. If you want to look up and feel good about how humans are capable of building buildings, I wanted the, the perspective to look down at what is, um, what is unlooked, at what is mm. uh, despised. Uh, so I, 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 inside the, the, this, this uh, crack, uh, there, is, there is a wire mesh um, to show that wherever we are, if the earth is, opens up, there will be a barrier to prevent us from going in. So it is, it is uh, I found a little crack at the entrance of the Tate, and I follow that crack, and then I open it up to the, to the end. Um, so, and I, and I wanted it to look like, like it just happened. Mm. Like, uh, like, I wanted the intrusion of this work in the turbine hall uh, to be felt like, like the intrusion of, 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 a, of a sub-Saharan migrant in, in this room right now, or in, 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 in a homogeneous European society. Uh, so it is, it is supposed to be irrational. It's supposed to be an irrational event crossing through this rationalist building. So I, I, I needed um, to mark this scar, the world is scar. And this piece left a scar mm. in, 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 uh, at the Turbine Hall, which at the time considered the very heart of, of European culture. Yeah. 
so that's why I wanted to bring that. And also I wanted to show that, that the history of art is, is an accomplice uh, in, in the system of, of racism. Uh, because in art, art has always presented a figure of, of the white uh, uh, Christ is white, the virgin is, is the white. white. Everyone is white, even though they were Semitic and of course they were not white. Uh, but but uh, they have built this beautiful radiant image of the blue eyes that are like the sky and the blonde mm. hair that is like the sun and so on. And against the erased figure of all other darker human beings. So I wanted uh, to, to show that, 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 that art uh, has to also tell this story from our perspective. That's, that's what I attempted. And there, and, there, and there is Scar. I'm going to jump again because I'm conscious of time and I just, I, I think we should talk for a moment if we could about a much more recent work which you have just shown for the first time in Sharjah. I mean, I think you'd like to talk about this, but what you let's, prefer? Let, let, I'd, I'd like to talk about this this piece, Uprooted, which is now on view in the Sharjah Biennale, Biennial, and it is very few people, certainly very few people in this room would have seen it. So, but it grows out of your increasing concern about the climate crisis and the impact on the world and on societies across that world. Can you talk a little bit about the origin of this piece? Well, this piece uh, is part of my ongoing preoccupation on, on migration mm. and, and, of course, climate crisis, because um, the reason why um, a lot of, of people are being expelled from their home countries is because the, 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 the most... Uh, the, the countries on the equatorial, the hotter countries on, the, on Earth, have already reached a tipping point, and mm. agriculture is no longer possible. There is food sort, shortage, water short, shortage, and, and uh, people cannot live. Agriculture mm. is not possible. They have, to, they have to live, they have to move. And as you said at the beginning, one out of seven people are moving at this very moment. Mm. That's seven billion people on the move right now. So I wanted to address that, and I wanted to show that the migrant will never find a home. Mm. The migrant, uh, it's not welcome. And, and, and for them to have a real home, a place uh, for them, it's impossible to find. So I wanted to make a piece that was just outside the space. It, was, it, was, it had no inside the space. So I make this house that is absolutely uh, full of trees. There are 800 trees and there is very little room inside. Then the house is integrated a little bit. It begins spacing out a little bit. And then you have an image of, of like a wall, like, like the US-Mexican wall, that, that there are bars that you cannot cross it. And then it opens up even more. And then you have <laughs> the dead forest that actually created this, this, this exodus. So the, the, the piece is like, uh, now we see a lot of, of photos, of, of, of videos of migrants that make caravans. They walk together because it's safer. So I wanted this image of the caravan. I wanted the impossible house, I wanted the wall, and I wanted this caravan, and I wanted this dead forest. So that's what a brute it is, 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 is about. It's, it's about the brutality. Uh, it's the roughness of, of the experience of the migrant, the brutality of the experience of the migrant, and, and the fact that I, I research what happened, why they are being expelled, of course, as I say, the climate crisis, then the terrible journey they embarked on, uh, where they are kidnapped, uh, raped, uh, robbed, everything happens to them. Uh, and then the very few that managed to make it in the global north, uh, they, they perform the worst possible task and they are exploited because they know themselves, they know that they are 
uh, undesirables. They are figures that kind to, to the pariah. So they are extremely vulnerable. And so I wanted all this to be present in this house. But that was the beginning. That was when I was thinking and making the piece. But once I finished the piece, I realized that, that the piece is not only for the migrant, it's for all of us. We are all losing our common home. Uh, so I, it, it changed slightly when I saw the piece uh, completely installed. Yeah. Doris, I'm conscious that we need to stop. Okay. You've been incredibly gener generous in, in sharing your experiences, and as you've just said in relation to, to Uprooted, and the, mo the extraordinary thing about your work, I think, is that it is very much rooted in your search and in a particular event or a crisis or a but it has this universal significance for all of us. I mean, I'm a citizen of a country where the Prime Minister is making a big campaign to, as he says, stop the boats. Well, the boats only encounter... The, the whole migration issue, as you say, is a global problem. The British only really deal with it when it comes near their shore. And we should all be thinking about these bigger questions for the whole world rather than just for our own countries and for our own selves. But Doris, thank you very much for you, giving us so much time.